house stood on the corner of Allenby Road and Carmel Avenue. Carmel Avenue was the main street which came down from the sea before there was a harbour, it was the seashore, up to Mount Carmel. The uh, house was built of uh, limestone blocks, uh, like most houses uh, in, in for the Templars at the time. My grandfather was a builder. He had it built with Arab labour, which was usual on the uh, building sites. Our house was built in 1928, and the house was built out of stone, nature stone from the hills. And we had three stories, if you like to call it that. We had a cellar where all the goods were like wheat, barley, whatever we grew in Palestine was kept down in the cellar. In the middle room there was our living area and upstairs the house was not quite finished, it wasn't lined. One side of the house was the three boys. In the middle on top, usually my mother had a border. And on the other side, the, the youth club used to have their meetings. We had in Haifa a Gemeindehaus gewohnt. There was im unteren Stock der große Saal. Und auf der anderen Seite auch ein ziemlich großer Raum, den man Zeichensaal Kaiser hat. Da war der Frauenverein drin und da war abends der Jünglingsverein und der Jungfrauenverein und da hat es auch Bücherei gegeben. Das ist so von der Gemeinde benutzt worden. Und im Oberstock war dann die Wohnung. In our front garden, most of the stuff was in pots, because the street was lined with eucalyptus trees, and it was a very dry area. The backyard, I would say, was, or the, the garden, about a half a hectare, full of vegetables. In Palestine, we could grow a crop all the year round, so we were very fortunate and most of the vegetables and whatever was grown in that garden, from potatoes to tomatoes to watermelon. A few trees, not very many apple trees, that did not grow too well. But then again, oranges, we did not grow at home because there were so many other big orange groves, where there was always plenty of oranges left over for the family. We had a, a lovely garden in Tsarona, Lots and lots of flowers and trees, even bananas, all kinds of uh, citrus fruits, and uh, we loved it there. Well, the job around the house, there was plenty of them. And Saturdays, first of all, you clean all the shoes of the family. You sweep the yard. You start the copper up in your laundry, make the hot water for your bath at night, get the firewood in for mum. There was no electricity, so it's all by firewood. Of course, we all had to do our chores. And I remember I was the youngest. And when the older children were told to do something, there was a call, Mata! do this and that. So they always tried to put it onto me, which wasn't fair, I thought. And sometimes I was naughty and I kicked them. <laughs> so we had plenty to do on a Saturday morning. But there was always enough free time to muck around a bit. There was no fences between the houses. So hide and seek would play uh, soccer keep going to call. Not enough people to have teams, but you always can muck around with the football. We played games at school, mostly ball games. We were very good. Ruth Lashinsky or Ruth Ha at the time and I were the best ones. When we threw a football, everybody who co collected it fell over. <laughs> and we always won. It was two parties, there was a field with two parties and we threw against each other. 
So that was called Völkerball. Or we had uh, Zurücktreiberless, which was you threw a tennis ball as far as you could. And then wherever it fell down, the other party had to throw it back. If I threw that ball, the game was finished. The ball ended in the next block. I was very good at throwing balls. <laughs> Well, now, I was, too, I was too much of a coward to get into mischief. <laughs> but we played seasonal games. One day, everybody played marbles. And then, of course, we had bikes. And we played polo on the bikes with croquet sticks. Very dangerous. <laughs> One of our main entertainment as kids was swimming. Because it's warm climate, you had six months of the year to go swimming. In the early days, we had to walk one to two kilometers to go to one of them basins in those orange groves. Mainly boys, we never played with girls them days. Every settlement that we had in Palestine had their kinder facilities. That was very well organised. That is a Templar scene. Education was number one, and everybody, whether they had children or not, was obliged to help with the, uh, with the costs of schooling. And most of the teachers, of course, were drawn from the Temple Society. Six years old, then I started school. And I loved school right from the start. I was one of the youngest because school only took new pupils every two years. So I was just six when I went into first grade and we still had slate boards with a sponge to save on exercise books. And I had a lot of mistakes in my uh, dictation and I had to, I forgot to write it again and I just wiped out the mistakes and put in and I said the teacher said to me but Emma you didn't rewrite that I said yes I did and she said oh I could weep you lying to me <laughs> and I felt so ashamed with the Oberschule da we were in our class nur sieben weil wir waren die Kriegskinder und da waren dann nicht mehr so viele Kinder. Wir waren fünf Mädchen und zwei Buben. Und auf jeden Fall hätten die Buben da müssen, was wir ihnen gesagt haben. In our home, there were very strict rules. My father was a very strict man, but he was a good man. We were sent out of the house if visitors came, because children didn't listen to grown-up talk. So he, I usually disappeared into the garden. I was brought up to be, be honest. What you do when you do right? What else can I say? I mean, respect your neighbor. Und so hat man uns Kinder eigentlich erzogen. Man hat uns nicht lange Vorschriften gegeben, aber wenn wir was Falsches oder Dummes gemacht haben, hat man gesagt, das darf man nicht tun. Und das hat man sich gemerkt, sonst ist man bestraft worden. Templerfeste wurden celebrated with Gaster. Holiday times and so, that was a big deal. That was we on uh, Palm Sunday, uh, several people on, on, in Bethlehem had palm trees. Well, they got raided every time, and uh, the hall got uh, decorated with uh, palm fronds. And uh, there was always greenery involved. Uh, when there was a wedding or something else, they, they had garlands and wreaths, and so green and flowers. and. Uh, that was always uh, a very jolly time and uh, something that I did not, uh, we did not quite have the same here. Templar celebrations was the May excursion, that was the biggest one, which we 
celebrated in the forest or in the Haradierwald, it was called, between Haifa and Bethlehem, one of the colonies, one of the rural colonies. And everybody went there. Every year, hitch up the cars, horse cart, and the family, all the families, one after the other, go to different places. We all took our picnic lunches, you would call it these days, and spend the whole day there. And it was great fun for young and old. Christmas in Bethlehem was something special. We used to walk from our house down to the schoolhouse in the dark. All the kids had to line up on a bühne, uh, bühne, on the stage and uh, sing and deliver the little verses and uh, it, it was great. As a, a child you remember things, everything's twice as high and twice as I remember the Christmas tree, oh, it was huge, but uh, if I saw it today, well, it would be a nice big Christmas tree, but it wouldn't be huge. My dreams and plans was to become a farmer, like all the other Wilhelm. I finished after eight years of schooling, and I went straight into the farming at the age of 15 the two last years of my life in Wilhelma, I was more or less the farmer. So the getting up at what, three o'clock in the morning, milk the cows, have the milk delivered before daybreak. And then in the hot summer days, you work till about 11 or 12 o'clock, especially in harvesting time. And uh, in the afternoon, you have a rest. And in the evening, you start milking again. So that was the day. They had uh, wooden forks with white tines, and when you had a, the grain there with all the bits of chaff still in it, you wait for a nice breeze and then you throw it up and uh, it blows the chaff away and, and, and the grain. After doing it a few times, the, the grain is clean. All the men, my father, etc., they were expert at it. Um, my dad employed two Arabs, one for the stables and chooks, and the other one was for out in the field. Our Arabic as children wasn't terribly good, uh, but we had the um, main phrases and so on. We could uh, make ourselves understood. We had a washerwoman. And we had a lady who came to sew our clothes once a year. Fräulein Haschele, she was called. And our washerwoman came every wash day, and she sat in the laundry, which was in the bottom part of the house. And she sat there on the floor with big tubs in front of her and a washing board. Miriam was her name. She was an Arab woman. The war started for me in September 1939, early September 39, when one evening my father didn't come home. My mother was worried, and only much later, with several days later, we found out that he was taken from his car on his way home in the middle of the street in Jaffa by the British police because war had started. We hadn't even realized that. Viele Leute sind dann noch gerade kurz vor Kriegsausbruch, junge Männer zum Teil mit ihrer Familie nach Deutschland. We lived in Jerusalem and then we went back to Sarona because Sarona was, was uh, then converted into an internment camp with barbed wire all around it and guards in sentry boxes right around and uh, curfew, not allowed out after dark. So I had to, if you wanted to do something after dark, you had to go and sleep somewhere else, like on the big stacks of hay. And we also smoked inside the high stacks, back of all, with a candle to sit there and smoke. So, yes, <laughs> I started smoking when I was eight. 
and I gave it up when I was 50, when I was 78. So the house for our family was quite roomy, but uh, when the uh, occupation or the war came and we were locked in in Bethlehem with all the people from Haifa, etc., from uh, eight people in the house, it went up to 22 people and uh, it had to be juggled carefully. But mum was an expert at it. She was, she was not, uh, she never ever wanted conflict and she was able to keep the peace like, uh, like nowhere else. Uh, uh, that, that was one old lady said, ja, auf der Kolonie, da kracht's überall. On, in, on, the, on the colony, there is strife everywhere, but not at the place. <laughs> So uh, that was that was our mum. She was fantastic. During that time, there was a big house search going on, and we were all herded out of the houses we were lived in and had to stay the whole day in the schoolyard in the hot sun, whilst the military, the army, searched through our houses and did a lot of damage in there. Also stole things. I remember that some of my, I had a nice bracelet, wasn't be found afterwards. Even my uh, Zeugnisbuch, what's that? My report book from school was missing. I don't know what they wanted to do with that. Well, the first one and a half years, Wilhelma was fenced in as a, a compound, as a prison, right? Arabs worked outside, we worked inside. We kept everything going. Und alle Arbeit, die arabische Arbeit, habe ich bereit dafür. Jetzt, die Kühe müssen gemolken werden, der Stall muss sauber gemacht werden. Und das sind wir, wo das alles hin machen müssen. Und es war ziemlich schwer, weil ich habe nicht keine Melken. Ich habe mir so all das lernen. When they were putting the poles up and the glass insulators to carry the wires, the poles were outside the wire fence and uh, caught with his uh, Shanghai and a few nicely chosen stones, he could do some real damage. So behind our house and the neighbor's house, the uh, insulators always got shot off and the uh, commandant was sick of it, he said, Somewhere in this establishment there is a rifle and I am going to find it. At that time, um, Mr. Pockenbell, who was a bit older than some of the others, uh, he was the elder for the colony there and he said, no, 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 he said to the commandant, just give me a bit of time, I'll find out what's going on. He lined us kids up and uh, somebody must have spilled the beans that it was caught. And so he went to the commandant and said, there's your culprit, what are you going to do about it? And he said, I don't believe it. He wanted a demonstration. So we all, with the kids, it was a, it was a great novelty, all went up to uh, behind our establishment and uh, he said, right, do your thing. So he got to Shanghai out and uh, shot once, nah, twice, nah. With the third one, he knocked the insulator down and he said, right, I'm not going to look for a rifle anymore. This is enough. And he said, and to you kids, I just say this, any more damage and there will be no Shanghai's in this. I confiscate a lot. I had to school halt them. It's not not to learn more. I had in Wilhelm, because many fort come in, but I'm not from Andrea there. And then I had to say I was good in the school, and I've been at least three or four years older than the upper class. Now the upper class is my class, and I'm a class teacher. 
Und das ist erstaunlich gut gegangen, weil das waren bloß fünf Kinder. Da kann man nicht ohne nicht ohnartig sein, wenn ein Mensch einem gegenübersteht und alle fünf gleichzeitig angucken kann. Und die haben dann lieb und brav bei mir gelernt. Und in der Pause haben wir alle miteinander Spiel gemacht. In Wilhelm war mein last teacher was Hulda Wagner. She must have been uh, sort of 18 or something like this, a, a Hilfslehrerin. Yeah, for me, she was she was a respect person. Was to had you, you had to give her respect. But when I got, when we talk nowadays, we sometimes laugh <laughs> because she said she didn't know all that much more. <laughs> In a lot of us were sent to Australia under Queen Elizabeth. We never knew where it's going to go. There, in, in a bit of a distance, was this huge ship. And as we got closer, it got so huge. And uh, it was the Queen Elizabeth. The biggest ship in the world, but uh, it was sort of converted as a troop carrier. We, there were six of us in one in a cabin that was originally meant for two. But they couldn't do anything to the bathroom and that was sheer luxury. And you should have seen when we went through the Red Sea, it was so hot and Helga had summer, uh, summer failure, you know, in a, a heat rash. And I sat with her in the bath and in came seawater with all the phosphorescent, it was like fire coming out. It was really, really wonderful. The food situation was not good. If the food was tailored for soldiers, there was no milk, there were no eggs. So people with small children, they had problems. Every table, longish table, got one or two uh, German soldiers, uh, a few Italians, but mainly German German soldiers, serving the food, and it went like clockwork. It was uh, excellent. And on top of that, there was uh, one with a violin and one with a piano accordion, and we had the most beautiful German music. German songs and uh, oh, it was fantastic. I can still hear them today. What I must say is when we got into the trains in Wilhelma, we were treated like a bunch of cows. There you in, close the door. And when we come to Australia, the first thing we got in Australia is a number. We got a seat on the train. We were treated like humans. We got a packet of sandwiches and a piece of fruit. Down in Palestine there was nothing. You're in there, go. What's the difference? When we landed there, it was freezing cold. There was a freezing wind. And when we left Palestine, there was a, a Honon who years ago had taken part in an old man. He had taken part in the uh, gold rush in Australia. And everybody just packed lights to oh, Australia, yeah. And he said, don't make a mistake. He said, take some warm things. He said, it gets terribly cold. Well, he was, he was at Ballarat and Bendigo, and it does get cold. So, uh, we were lucky, we, we got that message, and people did have a, a, a jumper and so on. The night we arrived, six of us were left behind. Everybody was treated and, and sent into a room, into a hut, in a hut. Six boys stand there under that big tree, and the guards are gone. What happens now? 
Fritz Katzewald come past and said, look, we got two rooms, but we have the kids and all of us in another room. We can bunk into the next room. So six of our boys just bunked in the, on the floor of the spare room, four feet off the ground in August, wind blowing through underneath. But it was still all fun. When we got there, uh, the, the, there were those tin huts, no lining inside, just tin, freezing cold in winter and uh, of course in summer. It must have been 50 odd degrees in those huts. Oh. Uh, you opened the door and went in and there was a uh, uh, couple of lumps of wood, thick lumps of wood nailed against the, 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 the side, uh, against the wall with one leg down and the rest was supported by the wall inside with wire netting and uh, there was a um, a hessian bag lying on the wire netting and a bale of straw. So we got there and uh, we had to make our own mattresses, which smart. The family in the camp, often evening, everybody went to uh, up into the dining halls and then people, women took their knitting and my father translated the English newspaper. And he was marvellous because he would, uh, what was that thing when, when the British borrowed from the uh, Lend and Lease? He translated that for Lump and Pump. <laughs> and then he, 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 he translated freely and everybody said, that's not in the paper. He said, it's not what's written in the paper, it's what you read between the lines. That is important. <laughs> the food in camp, especially in camp three, where the family where we cooked ourselves were beautiful, perfect. On a Sunday, they did not deliver the meat. Usually, the coffee and everything was delivered in a horse car. On Sunday, there was nothing. So we had to go out to camp with wheelbarrows to get the meat. And you know what a bacon is? A bacon is about 50 kilo of pork. We used to get 10 of them for 330 people. Just a match how much meat that is for each of us. In the camp, yes, we had an excellent school because we had quite a lot of Catholic priests. You couldn't make them do kitchen duties or wash washrooms. So, and they were absolutely happy to teach us, very good teachers. I would not have been able to have an education like that because there were three boys to be educated and I would have just gone on and learned shorthand and typing and finish up in an office. But this, this was really a bonus for me because uh, those teachers were very, very well schooled. People from the camp they had a special stamp made. Now, so it's still that Tatura internment camp stamp. It's got about the circumference of a tennis ball. And there's a bayonet and the top bit of a, of a rifle and Tatura internment camp number three. They stamped all the reports with that stamp and that stamp was recognised, people like Hugo Mesele, etc., they could get straight into the uh, Melbourne Uni or the establishments. Meine Mutter hat sich entschlossen zum nach Deutschland gehen, weil dort war schon meine Schwester Magda mit ihrem Mann Udo Stotz und ihrem Sohn Hans Reiner, da war Paula, da war der Udo und der Alfred. 
Und dann hat sie gedacht, es wäre gut, wenn Familie beieinander wäre, denn mein Vater ist 1941 in Wilhelma gestorben. We, we were interned in Bethlehem from middle of December 1939 until we were exchanged to go to Germany in 1942. My father said to us, we should go to Germany to learn a trade or some a profession, because all I could do was milk cows. I mean, that's not a profession, is it? So my sister Erika, whose husband was in Germany anyway, she had a little boy, and my sister Else, she had a fiance in Germany who'd gone out with the German men at the beginning of the war on the last Greek ship. They all gone to Germany, and I, we went on this transport, but instead of going straight through what we thought to Germany, we were put into a camp which is called Atlit. We stayed there for six weeks and it was the most horrible, dirty place I had ever been to. It was my first introduction to bedbugs, for one thing. It was riddled with bedbugs and the toilets and showers were so grimy and dirty we did nothing but clean for days on end. And when the sergeant who was in charge saw how clean our, our compound was, he suggested that we should now go to the next one and clean that one up too. We said, not on your life, thank you. We've had enough. It was quite an adventure. At that stage I was eight and it was an adventure because we hadn't been on a train before, nor had we uh, been able to, to see new things. In other words, we were rather isolated in Palestine. The Templars were within their colonies and that was it, especially the younger ones. Our school years were rather disrupted by air raids. We just got there, there was alarm, we had to walk back to 20 minutes to our house and it became, uh, after a while, we didn't go. The school just shut down. Da waren wir ziemlich geschützt vor Bomberangriff. Einmal eh mir kommen sind ist ein Baum gefallen gewesen, nicht weit, aber in den Feldern, nicht weit weg von mir. Aber sonst war man ziemlich sicher, man hat aber immer den Fliegeralarm auch mitgekriegt, wenn in Stuttgart Bomben gefallen sind und wir sind dann in den Keller beim Haus gegangen. Das ist noch mal ein paar Stufen tiefer gewesen, als die Waschküche war. Aber manchmal ist man einfach nicht, vielleicht nicht aufgewacht oder was und die Nachbarin von über der Straße hat gesagt, gerufen, die hat es gemerkt, hört ihr denn nichts, es ist Fliegeralarm, gehen in euren Keller. <lacht> Dann ist mal so in den Keller gegangen, aber war nicht gefährlich in mir. Aber in Stuttgart sind gleich drauf kaum war man vielleicht eine Woche da, etliche Leute, die mit unserem Transport nach Deutschland kommen sind, ums Leben kommen. Die waren im Rückwanderheim, wo eigentlich meine Mutter mit uns auch noch Gewelle hat, bis man die Papiere in Ordnung gebracht hat oder so. Aber die Magda hat darauf bestanden, er kommt sofort an diesem Abend noch mit mir nach Moor. Er bleibt keine Nacht in Stuttgart. Es hat sich dann als guter Rat herausgestellt. There was no school, so what do you do? And this is where the war uh, became of interest because you took interest, you saw aerial fights right above us, which was most impressive for, for a sort of a 12, 13 year old, uh, because it, it, you tried to identify the planes. Was that an American? You knew who the German was, or was that the German shooting at the other one? In other words, you were in the middle of the war. You saw, sometimes you saw whole soldiers, a, a whole uh, platoons of soldiers moving along, heavily armed and so on, in their tanks and all this sort of thing. 
So we were very much involved. Inzwischen hat der Theo Wagner mir von Australien aus regelmäßig geschrieben, schon nach Palästina und dann auch jetzt nach Deutschland. Und wo er 21 Jahre alt war, da ist, hat er mich gefragt, ob er Briefe bin, heiratet hat. Und dann habe ich zu meiner Mutter gesagt, was soll ich denn sagen? Und dann hat sie gesagt, sag doch ja. Und dann habe ich ja gesagt, per, per Post. Und habe mich so mit ihm verlobt. My parents, who were left in Bethlehem in Palestine when I left to go to Germany, and my sisters, they had to flee when the Jewish underground came to Waldheim and occupied Waldheim and shot a few people. Und uns hat man gesagt, in 48 Stunden müsst ihr weg. Jetzt nur 70 Kilo. Ja, was nimmt man da alles mit? Da hat man schnell alles wieder in Seese gepackt und andere Sachen in Kiste. Man hat alles dahinter lassen müssen. Der, mein, der Gärtner hat noch unser äh, Pferdegespann mit und der Wagen und noch verschiedene Kühe. Und die Hühner sind alle da umeinander geflogen und was mit denen passiert ist, weiß ich auch nicht. Mehr. Und meine arme Katze, die war noch haben die Männer erzählt, wo da die Kiste aufgeladen haben. Das war noch auf der Bank liegen, auf der Terrasse. Und in Haifa, they boarded a ship, which took them to Cyprus, where they were in a tent camp on a beach. It's Golden Sands, it was called. So, uh, da waren so Kriegsgefangene, deutsche Kriegsgefangene in Zelte. Und für uns sind sie nur kleine Zelt aufgestellt, wo gerade drei Mann Platz geht hin. Meine arme Mutter, da ist man neu gefährlich weh. Man hat bloß in der Mitte keine aufrecht stehen. Aber man hat eine Unterkunft gehabt. Nehmen sie uns so Eisenbettstellen mit einem Strohsack. Ein Tier haben wir mitgebracht gehabt und ein paar Teppich. Und, 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 und dann später eine Federdecke. Ich meine, wir Junge war für uns herrlich. Bis für die Alte war es schwer. Da hat man eine große Baracke ist übernommen worden von den Kriegsgefangenen. Die waren noch ein Teil dort gewohnt oben. Da haben wir noch eine Küche gehabt und einen Speisesaal. Und dann im großen Zelt ist dann auch noch später eine Schule gemacht worden für die Kinder, die da waren. Und für die Kranke, eine andere Barack, wo dann aus abgeteilt wurde, ist, wo die jeweils zu zweit drin schlafen hin. And then they had the option either to go to Germany or to Australia. If they went to Germany, they would have been classified as enemies. And if they went to Australia, they were classified as enemy subjects. So of course, my father opted for Australia. We had to have accommodation and work before we were allowed to leave the camp. So myself, Hans Richter, was out before me and he sent me a telegram and it said, work, accommodation available. So I sh showed that to the authorities and I got me passed to go. At the day come, hop onto the train, land in the Flinders Street, Hans Richter was not there. But there was another Italian friend I knew just as well from camp and he picked me up and we went out on the Spencer Street and there was a tram standing full of people. It was, must have been some kind of a strike. strike. And he said, push in, push in, push in. Uh, so we pushed in and we got to Hans's room and there was another a room, enough for a bed, and a mattress next to it. 
So he pulled the mattress off, one slept on the bed and one on the mattress. The next time we walked down Collins Street to look for a job and fair enough, one of the inmates from Camp One, Italian, worked in a cafe and he was the boss there. We asked him, Martinelli, have you got a job? Yes, you can come and wash dishes. So that's where I landed the next day, wash dishes. My father was very friendly with one of our commandants who lived right, quite next into Tura. He, he lived the, uh, and I went there as a maid. And there were three little boys under three. And they still write to me. And I just fell in. And of course, my contribution to the German war effort was not to learn English. I could speak French, I was very good at Latin, I could talk a bit of Arabic, but not English. The employment of it in Manly Gamma. And then guckt, ob man irgendeine Stelle kriegen kann. Und er hat dann in der Limonadefabrik bei Miners irgendein körperliche Arbeit gefunden und zu mir haben sie gesagt, am besten wäre, wenn ich in einer Familie arbeite, dann würde auch mein Englisch besser werden. Ich habe wohl Englisch gelernt, gehabt in der Schule, aber australisches Englisch habe ich nicht unbedingt verstanden. Da ist mir der Dialekt arg aufgefallen, wie anders das war. So I went and uh, looked for another job. And I looked and I looked and I looked and everywhere I went, they said, sorry, what you did overseas doesn't count here. And so I got to know the family of the Bingles. And so he was a company director. And when I was looking for work, Mrs. Bingle rang me at the private hotel I was living in at Bondi. How did you go today with work, looking for work? I said, same as always. And she said, look, my husband said they're looking for a typist in the office. Go in and see the accountant. He knows all about it. So of course I went. The accountant, Mr. Perry, said, you know, we can't pay you the award wage because as far as we're concerned, you have no experience. I thought, yeah, just wait till I've got my foot in the door. But Mr. Bingle wants you to start, so you can start. And when I started, I had to type long double sheets. They were the agents for cattle stations up in the Northern Territory. And I had to do the yearly accounts and I had to join those sheets in the middle. And you couldn't see where one ended and where the other one started. Mm. That correct. And they all said, never seen work like that before. I said, yes, considering I'm, I have no experience, not bad, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to join the public service because I thought that is uh, the safest. And Commonwealth Serum Laboratories to me sounded wonderful because it sounded like really something. I joined CSL in 1948 and I started off having to sweep floors and I made it up to production manager of the block. <laughs> so I'm very proud of that. And they have a special tree which has got a plaque underneath. This is the Emma Polacek. So maybe I'll get them to put my ashes there because that's already a plot. <laughs> In early 50s, it was not very easy to get a job when I left the cafes. It was not for me to be in a, in a cafe. So uh, I worked, I made roof tiles. I made, I slaughtered chickens for a, half, a year at the Sunbeam poultry farm where everybody else worked. And I started building here. I bought this block. My mother-in-law bought it when it was subdivided and she gave it this block in 1950. So I started making bricks on the weekends up front here. I got two templars to lay the bricks for me. 
I get Hans Pisch and Alfred Edelmeier to do the inside, all this hard plaster on the ceiling. We moved into here, Christmas 52. Später ist dann, haben wir unser Haus angefangen zu bauen, aber damals hat man immer wieder auf Materialien warten müssen. Alle Leute haben damals Häuser bauen wollen, die Soldaten, die vom Krieg zurückgekommen sind. Man hat warten müssen, dass man das richtige Holz gekriegt hat. Und vor allen Dingen die Dachziegel, da hat man einen extra Ertrag noch stellen müssen, dass man ein kleines Kind hätte und jetzt unser zweites erwartet und dass man das Haus also nötig braucht. Und dann hat es geklappt. Ja, Uh, sticking together because outside of that, in the first few years, you were the foreigners, you were isolated, very much so. I remember one day in, in the Sydney tram, when they still had trams, uh, I spoke to my mother, I think it was, or to my father, uh, in German. And somebody turns around and says, why don't you speak bloody English? You know, not exactly bloody foreigner, but that was implied. Yeah. Uh, not much has changed, I guess, <laughs> when you look around. <laughs> but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy. To assimilate it wasn't easy. And I certainly wasn't, wasn't here comes the, you know, the good old German. I changed my name. I didn't use my first name because in first day in school, Herman the German, so that was it. I used my second name, Ralph, which was a proper name, and that nobody could tell the difference. After a while, you couldn't tell that I was a German. I had immer been thinking at the beginning, we need just money to buy things. In Deutschland it was so hard in the last time. There had to be for all the expenses. Not just with money had to buy things. And the rations were very low after the war was over. And we had to buy everything to buy things, as we wanted. I thought, that's wonderful. We were very fortunate not to be sent somewhere else in the world because it was such a free and coming up country. I mean, in the olden days you could touch anything and make it a success. A bit harder now, I would say. The Templars as a whole, they've done wonderfully well in Australia. Goodness me, there's doctors and professors and you name it. Uh, nurses, straight people, everything you could, you could just, and they're all doing well. Nobody's been locked up in jail, good people. So we benefited from being here, and Australia certainly benefited from having those Templars here. <laughs> 